Okay, so Melissa, if you're ready to um, get your slides up. So I, I kind of don't need to introduce Melissa since you've already kind of met her. I think most of you were in the session just now. Um, but uh, yeah, Melissa is doing some really, really interesting work um, uh, about kind of how metadata, good metadata might save the world, could save the world and possibly is saving the world. So um, I will hand over to you, Melissa. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's really an honor to be back to do another keynote at Pitapalooza. Um, and it's neat to sort of rep report on some of the sort of same trajectory um, that our community has been working on relating to identifiers. Um, and so, uh, so today I'm going to I'm going to talk about. Hopefully, can you see my slides? I'm always this is a new platform for me, so yeah, <laughs> I can't see you now. You. No, it's good. Great. Thanks. Um, Okay, so today I'm going to talk about how many rare diseases are there and how good identifier provisioning can help answer this question. Um, and so if you think about um, a person, um, we can measure a lot of different things about a person. And, you know, I come from the sort of biomedical community where we have clinical encounters and measure lots of things. If you've been to the doctor, you've probably had some blood tests and clinical labs, maybe some imaging, some drugs prescribed, and all these things have identifiers. We also have a lot of sort of emerging high throughput data about people um, such as like, you know, mo you know monitoring and, and wearables and microbiome. And most of these things have identifiers too, although um, some of the high throughput data, the identifiers are sort of handles on which many other content um, sits. But, you know, really integrating all the data about a person still requires identifier management. And today I'm gonna talk about this problem in the context of rare diseases. So um, in 1983 in the United States, um, we, we had what was called the Orphan Drug Act. Um, and the goal of this act was to basically say, we need to help support drug development for um, rare diseases. And so back then there was only 34 approved drugs. Um, and now um, this, this is a lot of date, but in 2018, we were up to 730 approved drugs for, for rare diseases. Um, and what you see over here on the right um, is, a, is a current snapshot of, of a really wonderful resource called Global Genes, which describes many rare diseases. And it still states the 7,000 or so distinct rare diseases number that was documented back in 1983 um, when the Orphan Drug Act was first created. Well, it's clearly the case that since 1983, we have learned that there are new diseases since, since that number of approximately 7,000 was described, yet we continue to use that same number to refer to the number of rare diseases. So why is the number of rare diseases actually hard to determine and not actually 7,000? So first of all, we don't have the same criteria for what rare means around the world. So. Um, in 1983, from the Orphan Drug Act, um, it stated that a rare disease affects fewer than 200,000 people. However, in 2000, in the European Union, for example, um, it was considered to be rare when it affects fewer than one in 2,000 people. So there's, so there's different ways of kind of measuring what constitutes rare. Um, and that information um, about um, the incidence, if you will, about a rare disease is not often captured for the different populations around the world. So that's some really key metadata that we often lack. We also add new diseases all the time, but we don't update that number. Why do we stay at 7,000 when we're updating new diseases in rare disease registries every day or every week? Um, uh, similarly, in the literature, uh, new entries are added all the time. We also have um, resources such as a, um, a wonderful program called the Matchmaker Exchange, which aims to matchmake uh, what we call N of 1, so patients that have the first known disease of that kind, to try to find the second known disease so that we can help um, understand the nature of that disease. Once you match that person to have N and N of 2, um, you can actually much better define the disease and, and record it um, in public systems so that when the next person comes along, we can actually say, aha, you look like these two other people. And so, um, and so, you know, clearly if we're adding new content all the time to our knowledge, um, it's, the number is going to change um, from 7,000. Fundamentally, we, don't, we also don't define or identify diseases in the same way. So there are dozens of terminologies and disease registries, each with their own identifier systems or even a lack thereof. The rare diseases themselves are not often included in the commonly used clinical terminologies. And fundamentally, the definition of how one defines a rare disease and how to model it computationally, so all kinds of information around what that disease actually is, is attached to an identifier. Um, and and um, this has remained, the process of defining a disease has remained more of an art than a science, which means that the stuff that hangs off that identifier 
um, is rather crufty at times and not necessarily consistent across different sources. So why do I care about how many rare diseases there are? Well, not having clear definitions of what a rare disease, what rare diseases are, makes it harder to build diagnostic tools and reveal mechanisms. The identifiers matter. You could get different diagnoses um, if you have a rare disease if the, the data across different systems is not reconciled. And I put a link here to the, the paper for um, identifiers for the 21st century, which I, I pasted in the, in the prior um, session, which is a community manifesto that was written in 2017 uh, to really help support this. And, and much of what we're going to talk about today is really based upon uh, some of these community best practices. So just very briefly, so you know a little bit of the science behind uh, what we're going to talk about. So um, we work on a lot of ontologies, and ontologies are graph structures um, of concepts. So here, for example, is a human phenotype ontology. And in the context of the human phenotype ontology, we have terms that describe um, key um, phenotypic characters. So things about a person. So for example, deeply set eyes or abnormal eye morphology or hyposmium. And these all have identifiers. And these identifiers are logically associated with other identifiers coming from other ontologies, such as the gene ontology, which has a lot of data associated with that term, uh, the sensory perception of smell, because hyposmia is the dysfunction in the sensory perception of smell, whereas the gene ontology is capturing information about which genes and which species um, are associated with sensory perception of smell. So all of a sudden we have this connectivity um, with an enormous amount of data simply from that one identifier describing the absence of smell in this patient. And so this, this is a resource that's used by many rare disease communities to describe their patients' features and algorithms can help diagnose the patients using these ontologies. Um, and this is just an example of why these identifiers matter and, and how that works. So I, I won't take too long on this, but essentially we have two patients here, one on the left, one on the right. Um, the 14 year old boy has long toes, whereas um, we, that um, uh, um, the, the little girl on the left uh, doesn't have any abnormalities of the toes. And, and when these two patients came into the same clinic within a few weeks of each other, both of them were really challenging to diagnose until they were described using this ontology with these identifiers. And once these identifiers were um, applied, we were able to diagnose these two patients, both with Weidemann Steiner syndrome, based upon the non-exact graph matching of those identifiers to the information shown in blue in the middle. So for example, the long toe actually matches short toe because those are related to one another. Um, and some are exact and some are um, non-exact and some are opposites. But as it turns out, long toes and short toes are sibling identifiers in that same graph. And so they're very closely related. And so both of these patients received a diagnosis and we understand now what their molecular mechanism of their disease is, which can help design strategies for their care. So when we think about how to define a rare disease, there are many different domains. There's cancer, there's complex disease, infectious diseases, rare diseases, and Mendelian diseases. And there are many different terminologies and ontologies that, can be, that have been built to describe these. And they all have mappings to each other. So fundamentally, the, the challenge that we're going to talk about today is about mapping. So problem with mappings is they're often mutually inconsistent. And there can be n to the second order sets of mappings. And the mappings are not one-to-one -one equivalent so that you know, a term in one of those ontologies is not uh, an identifier in one of those ontologies, is not necessarily equivalent to another one in another ontology, but maybe is equivalent to a set of them or to a pair of siblings or a parent and child. And it can be get very complicated in terms of how we map these identifiers across these different resources. Um, and so this is just an example of that. Um, uh, where did the definitions for these identifiers come from? So here's a, a laundry list of different terminologies, all representing um, ostensibly the same disease called Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. But you can see that the labels um, are a little bit variable between the different sources. They all have their identifiers there on the left. Um, they're represented here as curies, but um, they're not necessarily natively curies. Um, and some of them have definitions and synonyms and child terms, and they have different kinds of incoming and outgoing mappings that you can see the smattering of over on the right. And some of them have data associated with them, and some of them, and most of them don't. And so essentially what we have done then is to say, okay, well, are these really all equivalent? Um, do we know that Ehlers-Danlos syndrome classic type is actually the same thing um, as the NCIT um, version of Ehlers-Danlos? And how do we know that? 
Um, and so a colleague of mine, uh, Chris Mungle, built an algorithm called KBOOM, um, which actually reconciles the identifiers from the different graph structures to try to find the most parsimonious equivalence cliques between the different identifiers. Um, and so here is a kind of a, a diagram of why the mappings are insufficient. Um, you can see if you've got all these different terminologies, this is or, or identifiers from the different sources, you could have mappings between all of them, but that's that's the end to the second order set of mappings. Um, and you know what those mappings actually mean? Are they equivalent? Are they broad? Are they narrow? Um, how how they go stale? Um, they're they're conflicting in all the ways that I mentioned. And so this is really the mess that we're trying to clean up. And here's an example. So here's two different resources. Um, here we have the um, a National Cancer Institute's thesaurus, where we see that peripheral neuropathy is a subtype of neuropathy, which is a subtype of a peripheral nervous system or PNS disorder, and you can see their identifiers. But when we um, look at the mappings, PNS disorder is mapped to um, the UMLS peripheral neuropathy, and the peripheral neuropathy in the NCIT um, uh, is similarly mapped to peripheral neuropathy, but the, the parent term neuropathy over there on the right is mapped to neuropathy. And when we, when we put these all together, we end up with a cycle so that um, peripheral neuropathy is now a child of neuropathy, but neuropathy is a child of peripheral neuropathy. And if you're classifying a patient and you wanna understand what kind of neuropathy they have, you kind of need to know that there's not cycles because you can't, it, you know, the reasoner will not um, allow you to classify the patient if the annotations are um, uh, in a cycle as, such as this. So um, the other problem is, is that um, the different communities um, developed different kinds of annotation structures for these identifiers to the disease. So for example, over on the right, ClinVar is a resource that curates a disease identifier to a variant identifier. Um, the online Mendelian inheritance in man cur curates the disease to gene identifiers. We curate um, in the Monarch Initiative for the HPO um, disease to phenotype associations. And really fundamentally, the model for all the things that you might want to associate uh, the disease to um, really is the combination of all of these things. But because that hook over there on the left for disease has not been reconciled across these sources, it makes it very challenging to combine all these different resources into the same model. And so we have a project called the Lumping and Splitting Project, which helps us systematically understand which diseases are actually unique um, and which ones are different. Um, and there's a bunch of scientific criteria uh, for realizing this. And then we capture that provenance um, with the identifier. Um, and this is how that process happens. So we take all the different uh, ontology and terminology sources and use that um, KBOOM algorithm to create these equivalence cliques. Um, and we look and the, the algorithm spits out a probability of equivalence. And so for the ones that are, are, are funky, they have a low probability of equivalence, we curate those and then push those back in. And in doing so, we found some really interesting um, artifacts in the source terminology. So for example, in the mesh terminology, which is often used for literature annotation, there were whole branches that were annotated that, that were um, essentially equivalent, but were um, uh, described using uh, alphanumeric and Roman numerals. So we had, you know, Ehlers-Danlos type one with the Roman numeral and Ehlers-Danlos type one with the, the, the number one. Um, and those are actually equivalent. And so there was a whole branch that needed to just go away uh, because it was an accident that it was implemented in, in both formats. Um, and this is what it looks like when you put it all together as an example. These are just four of the, of the many resources and, and they, they all get sort of interleafed together. Um, the, the heavy lines are the sort of subclass uh, between the identifiers and the, the lighter colored ones are, are the mappings. And you can, you can kind of see how the classification of disease can be kind of much more thorough if we leverage the knowledge um, from all the different sources, but reconciling all these different identifiers from these different sources is of course very messy along the lines of the things I've just shown you. Um, and so we've developed this new um, ontology that harmonizes them all called Mondo, which means for the world. Um, and it uses what we call a dead simple ontology design pattern, which is a way of populating the metadata um, about the logical descriptions of those identifiers using a common pattern. And the pattern has a label, a text definition, synonyms, and a, and a computable logical definition. And it's written in a little YAML file like you see over to the right. And in this way, we can manage the, the information about um, how all the provenance of the mergers between these different terms, these different identifiers coming from the different terminologies um, are actually captured and harmonized. And so this is what um, an, the anatomy or the stuff that's connected to the PID um, actually looks like. 
Um, and so you can see a hierarchy of these, these PIDs over there on the left. Um, and then you can see all the cross references and, um, and how, how they've sort of been captured. And then um, a, a number of other um, information sources that, that are not non-exact matches, but sort of see also's, if you will, as well as a definition and other information. And not all the information is shown in this interface, but um, you get the idea. And there's a persistent resolvable identifier um, that is uh, Mondo underscore 0019249 with a Perl um, that's uh, always uh, part of a version uh, release um, every month. So coming to the point of the talk, um, we have, um, this is really where, where the rubber hits the road. So how many rare diseases actually are there? So we took all these different sources and we figured out which ones were rare based on frequency patterns. And then we, and then we just classified them all and said, okay, let's look at what they look like and different sources. And we were really shocked to find over 10,000 um, rare disease concepts. So that's quite a lot different than the 75, the 7,000 or 7,500 that were first represented back in 1983 and the number from which we've been quoting all this time. And what was interesting was that many diseases were really only in one source. So here, for example, there were 1600 plus um, diseases that were only in Orphanet. And even more shocking, um, of these um, five sources, which theoretically ha should have a lot of overlap in the rare disease space, only 333 disease concepts um, were shared across all five sources. And I don't mean just labels, but actually reconciled identifiers representing a rare disease entity that we could we could confidently say, you know, was the same entity in different sources based upon the um, uh, algorithmic merging and curation of those. Um, and so this was um, pretty surprising and it's still a work in progress. There's, there's you know, le not likely exactly 10,577, but um, because there's still a lot more reconciliation to do. But one of the wonderful things about this is it's really been able to demonstrate to these different communities how if we can work together, um, we can actually capture the provenance of the identifier reconciliation across sources and then improve the source um, the sources in their use of those terms, and then those sources data can actually be combined much more readily to have, help populate diagnostic tools and thereby um, help diagnose more patients. And so if you're interested in this sort of thing, um, there's just some information here about where you can view um, the ontology. Uh, we have weekly calls and a mailing list, um, a GitHub account, um, and really, really enjoy uh, working closely with um, the community on this project. Um, and so I wanted to thanks, uh, say thanks to all of the users and contributors. Uh, you can see um, all the different global community that's working together. It, you know, it varies from, you know, people working on molecular cell um, things to um, Genomics England, um, diagnosing patients, biobanks, um, you know, Ancestry.com, um, all kinds of different uh, uh, resources. Um, I especially want to thank the ClinGen community because um, they have really been um, one of the, the greatest partners in the lumping and splitting um, aspects and how we define diseases. And then finally, last but not least, um, this is just a list of all of our wonderful um, major uh, developers of the resource. And with that, I'd be happy to take some questions. Thank you. That's fantastic, Melissa. Really, really interesting. and. Um, uh, timely uh, look at how persistent identifiers used wisely and well um, can be can have a real impact on on people's lives. So we do have a few questions and we've got a bit of time, which is great. Um, the first one is: Do you have any insights into the social drivers which lead to a to a proliferation of ontologies for the same set of concepts? That's from Chris Shillam. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, you know. Uh, it's. It turns out it's a lot easier to build your own than it is to use somebody else. They say standards are like toothbrushes, um, you know. And I, I think you know. You think that you're just building. I mean, I think that the problem really is, is that you you think you're just building it for your website or your little project. But in the end, once you've sort of um, created a set of concepts with identifiers and it gets loosed on the world, you're, you're, you're always surprised at how other people are gonna use it. And you can never predict all the ways that people are gonna use it. Um, and so I think, you know, there's a tension there then between getting some work done quickly if you just have something you wanna do 
and you know, really leveraging the work of others that may not be exactly fit for purpose. Um, and so in the disease space, you know, um, you know, the cancer community doesn't want to use the Mendelian community's um, representation, it doesn't have everything they need. But then they go, and it's not just about the, the actual concepts and identifiers, but the actual models that, that, you know, one has for how you represent disease are a little bit different in those communities as well. Um, and so, you know, I think it, it really just takes, um, you know, community um, education about um, the downstream effects of, of, you know, what happens when you lose uh, a resource with a bunch of identifiers in it um, out into the world. And it's shocking where you find where you find them <laughs> and it, where they might not have been intended or are not um, really well used. And so maybe maybe part of the answer is, is education, but part of it is also just better um, better documentation when we do actually share our, our early beginnings, if, if you will. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, thank you. Okay, the next question is, is the quality of mappings within OBO ontologies measurably better than the mappings between OBO and non-OBO ontologies? And that's from Philip Strimmert. Um, I would say the, that the mappings between OBO OBO ontologies are getting better. We have a new um, mapping standard called SSSOM, and because I can never say it, I call it the Slytherin standard. Um, so you can refer to that <laughs> as well. <laughs> um, and, uh, um, but it, uh, it, it's, you know, we're working with the community to try to improve the map. I would say right now the mappings are pretty poor in all across all ontologies and terminologies. Um, even mapping resources such as UMLS or NCIT also have, you know, their, their challenges like the cycles I, I showed with UMLS. Um, and, and the other problem with the mappings is that the, the actual curation rules or provenance of those mappings is very poor. And this is true for OBO ontologies, uh, whether it's to other OBO ontologies or, or out externally as well. If I say that, you know, my Fanconi, you know, type A is similar to Fanconi 1 in your system, like, you know, what, what rules did I use to decide that? Mm -hmm. Um, was it, was it just, did I just match the label? Did I actually look at the synonyms? Did I, was there an identifier cross-reference? Like that information is almost never included. Yeah. And so it's very hard to tell what does it mean to be a, a good mapping if we don't even know why the mapping was created in the first place. And so the, the new standard, um, Slytherin standard, um, aims to, to better document that information so that when you do share a mapping file, whether it's between um, uh, ontologies or other kinds of um, identifier sets like a code set or a, a value set um, that you actually have the provenance of the, the rationale behind what the mapping actually, um, you know, what the rules were for the mapping and how, how the information is actually captured. So that whole content of the mapping can just stop being, you know, one link between one, one identifier to another, but actually being, you know, a computable, you know, metadata representation about that one link. Um, and that's really where we need to get to. And, and the OBO community is, is working hard on, on doing that. And it will include other non-OBO ontologies like the NCIT and, and others as well. And yes, I totally agree. Standards have got to be more of an answer, haven't they? Um, OK, the next question is from Catherine Kaiser. Is the work being done to formalise what is known as the exposome and how it might modify phenotypes, for example, as it might relate to some cancers? Um, yes, absolutely. We have an ontology for that. It is very emergent, but we would love to have your help. Um, I will find you the link for that as well. Um, and, you know, really what this ontology aims to do um, uh, is, um, let's see, I can just put it, I'll put the GitHub link, I guess. Um, uh, what it aims to do is really inventory the different types of exposure um, routes as well as items. Um, and so there's kind of a, we had a workshop this last year that focused on you know, the a sort of kind of framework for the model that would, um, oh yeah, uh, Catherine, we also, um, the graduate student who's working on this is a nutrition PhD. So if you're interested in nutrition, we would love your feedback. Um, and she just posts, she just, um, uh, um, uh, published a paper yesterday um, on her evaluation of, of related ontologies, terminologies, and databases. I can find the link for that as well. Um, so, so we're essentially there's a small model that's associated with um, this this um, uh, environmental um, uh, exposure ontology that you know helps kind of represent because you need to know information about exposures that's not just 
you know, what the um, toxin is, but also things that are not toxins like nutrients, right? So are we exposed to, you know, too much vitamin C, for example, where line is falling um, or something like this. So it, it represents kind of exposure routes, exposure timing um, and uh, exposure items, whether or not they're, um, the exposure was high or low and things like this. And so um, this kind of similar to the disease models that I showed has a sort of model of, of exposure. So I'll find the top and the link. Thank you. We just have, we have, I think, hopefully time. We have two more questions. So I'm hoping you speak really fast. We can fit two more in. The first one is, is the mapping and alignment done um, automatically or is it done by domain experts? And that's from Klaus Weiland. So it is, um, it's a combination. So um, especially because we really aim to use this uh, Mondo resource in clinical settings, um, we have to have eyeballs on everything. But what, what we, we initialized it with the KBOOM algorithm computationally. And it was a mess because, you know, there was a lot of stuff that wasn't really reconcilable, um, had low probability of equivalence. And then also it, it kind of, the way the algorithm works, it kind of works on harmonizing the, the the lower level or leaf nodes as opposed to dealing with the upper level structures that you know those different classification systems might have very different strategies so diseases can be classified by you know onset or genetics or other things that are are less readily uh, amenable to this type of technique and so since then that was that was a few years ago we've been going through and curating all of the equivalences, writing definitions for them, checking to make sure their classification makes sense in the whole hierarchy, and then trying to build out um, that sort of you know, intermediate level portions of the hierarchy, which are really where the domain experts um, come in. And so um, we, we fortunately just got funding uh, a few months ago for this work work for five years. So it's going to be a long on stand, uh, ongoing effort to um, get the community to help with some of that domain expertise. But we aim to have every single term um, expert reviewed. Fantastic. And then just very quickly, the last question, because I think we can squeeze it in from Arthur Smith. A lot of disease and related biomedical identifiers have been loaded into Wikidata. Have you looked at correlating with those relations? Um, yes, I think we I can't remember if we've actually reconciled Mondo with some of those already. Um, you know, one of the challenges with Wikidata is that it's um, CC0, and um, and this is an identifier challenge in the ontology space for sure. And we made Mondo CC by. And so we, what we've been doing is trying to create kind of a slice of the Mondo um, graph that we could make CC0. We feel strongly about the CC by for the whole thing because it contains all the attribution and provenance um, of all of the content and we don't want that to get um, left behind. It's important for clinical decision making. Um, and so uh, so it's, it's this, this challenge of like actually needing to keep that information and we don't want people to lose it um, in a clinical setting, but at the same time, you know, we want to make it freely available and, and interoperable with the things in Wikidata. So I don't know if, if, if anybody has um, thoughts about that particular challenge, you can um, tweet me or, or get in touch. Okay. Well, thank you so much again, Melissa. That was a really fascinating um, talk, really different way of thinking about persistent identifiers and how they can have an impact in the in the real world. Um, so thank you. Um, we are off now to our different tracks. So um, hopefully you, you can stick around a little bit, but um, on Slack, if people have questions for you um, and yeah, thanks again and uh, see you all soon. <laughs>